Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called Now, and an activity called Work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of the most important decade in the history of the human species and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it all. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. What did you want to be when you grew up? Well, oh, when I well, when I was young and well, I wanted to be a rugby league player. Mm. Yeah, that was that was my jam back when I was like probably up until about twelve years old. Mm. And then suddenly I was like, oh, I want to be a radiographer in a hospital. Okay, that's quite no a idea where that, No idea where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> and then by the time I was going to. Um, sixth form and university. I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm. I mean, it was a it was a wide spectrum of what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, do you think that kind of diversity of interests came from already having a curious mind to look into different things and it's like, what's going on here? What's going on there? Uh, no, probably just a overactive imagination within myself and just going. Oh, I'm thinking I could achieve anything I wanted to, and yeah. then eventually the, the reality of me just not having the enthusiasm to follow things through mm. and it kind of hit because each of those jobs I wanted to be required years upon years of practice. And it's like, yeah, ugh, can't, can't do it. It's like <laughs> as a, as a child between the ages of 13 and 17, I used to be the sprinter for my age group from the city of Leeds. It used to be really fun. Yeah. yeah. I was running the hundred meters in 11 seconds and mm. the 200 meters in 23 seconds. And it was something I could have taken up, but then somebody was saying I'd have to train eight hours a day, four days mm. a week. It's like, yeah, that's, that's too much. <laughs> Find a job that doesn't involve all that training and prep. You're listening to series two, episode 30 and to my guest, Ian Thursfield. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 25th of November 2021. Evening workers, so no rants, no calls to action, no moodiness for this episode. I do have a quick note about quality for listeners. As I'm recording this on Zoom, it does, as it does a few times in this interview and some of the others, freeze or drop out some audio at points. People's connections and where they can meet me virtually affects the sound. Now, I don't give my guests any tips on recording good or better audio quality beforehand, as I'm generally just really grateful to get them on the show. And I can't believe they're willing to talk to me for this weird little thing that I'm doing. I'm especially surprised when they have actually heard the show and they're still willing to come on. Now, I don't think I need to make any more effort to improve the audio quality. You get a version of what I hear. I obviously do work on the sound, but I'm not itching to buy the most expensive mics or recording spaces or editing software if I can ever make any money out of this. So I'm not itching to do more work that no one has asked for than I already do by doing this. So if you're bothered about the sound, please let me know. And I'll probably say, well, I am doing it for free. And if you're someone who's thinking about working on a podcast with me, then just be aware that I can create better audio quality for your projects. Okay, I lied. I'm moaning. It's a short one, though. Pass ag moan over. Um, There might even be a call to action at the end. But let's crack on. Ian Thursfield is your friendly local zero waster. He likes to reuse bread bags and enjoys litter picking with his daughters. Ian is happy to answer any questions you have. Just ask his five-year-old. He really does answer every question uh, that would help you on your zero waste journey. His shop, Leeds Refills, is located at Hyde Park Corner and has a full range of items for your complete zero waste shopping needs. Their main goal is to help you to reduce the amount of single-use plastics that are used to get products to you. So much of our food today comes pre-wrapped in lots of single-use plastics, but that's not going to stand with Leeds Refills. Leeds Refills aims to source all of their food and products either plastic-free or with very minimal packaging to help cut the plastic supply chain. Leeds Refills has a full selection of refill dry foods, toiletries, household cleaners, kitchen and homewares available. Just bring some containers or use a paper bag on them down to Hyde Park Corner and get refilling. 
go to leadsrefills.co.uk or instagram.com forward slash leadsrefills. Let's hear all about it. What is it you do now then? Uh, I own and run a retail shop over in Hyde Park. Mm. Now that sounds like a fair bit of work itself. So yeah, prepared but, for that going in. But it's different. It's a different kind of work where I, I just sit in my shop and just pray that somebody comes into the shop to buy something. Um, and when, when they're not buying something, I'm cleaning some shelves and uh, doing orders. Mm. So then when I go home, I can still switch off. I don't have to think anything. I don't have to do any real training. I don't have to keep at it. In my spare time, I can find other interests elsewhere. Mm. Yeah, so that's why right. it's, it's, it is busy, but it's a different kind of busy. I don't have to constantly be learning, constantly be training, constantly be practicing something to get better at it. It's already there. Mm. I mean, you've got to do some of the work in terms of finding the location, finding the right premises and getting your marketing all set up and stuff. How did you, how did you start the shop? What made you come to the shop idea? We, did you have previous retail experience? How did it come about? And so an easy, an easy answer there is no, I had absolutely no retail experience at all. Uh -huh. um, the whole idea from owning and running a shop was, uh, so I wrote a bucket list when I was, when I was quite young, about 16 mm. years old. And I was like, what things do I want to achieve in my life? And one of them was run, run and own a business. Mm. Uh, it didn't matter if it was successful, who gives a shit about that? Just, just run a business. Mm. Um, and so about God, how many years ago would it be now? Be 2000, so six years ago, my auntie passed away. Um, and unbeknown to me, she'd left us a fair amount of money. Mm. Um, and it's one of those things where it's not really my money, it's somebody else's. So it might as well try something big with that. And if it fails wasn't my money to begin with. Um, and if it is successful, at least some use has come out of the money. I was like, right. Okay. Looking down my booking list and I'm like, right, well, we need to travel to Disneyland. So tick done that. Um, I need to climb a mountain. Okay. Tick done that. Start a family. That money helps tick done that. And it was like, all right, run a business. Right. Um, how do I do that? So then it was uh, researching. It was so many baby steps. It was, mm. you say doing all your research and doing all your planning and doing all your um, advertising. It was like, yeah, baby steps, maybe take a week just to build up the courage to look for locations and have a week to actually email somebody and say, is this space available? Um, and apparently from talking to people now, it's something back, back when I was at school, it was never really a thing was ADHD and um, never really talked about, and it was never really acknowledged. It was mm. we, and you must be dyslexic. I think it was always, you must be dyslexic. That was the big buzzword mm. at the time. Um, but now looking back on it with all the, the, how my brain works and like saying that whole coming up with an idea and then not following mm. through with it to much effort. Um, yeah. So due to the ADHD, um, we think anyway, it's just, uh, just couldn't wrap my brain around doing loads of jobs. So it was this thing, it's just trying to find that focus. And so it probably took about a year from having this money and deciding I was going to start a business to actually begin anywhere near to starting a business. Mm. It's actually going to be a board game cafe to begin with. All right, cool. Um, and I was going through the motions of that and I found a place it was quite close to signing a lease on it. I was having a crisis of confidence again, just, just not having the drive. The drive suddenly disappeared. I thought, oh, shit, what do I do now? And I found out another board game cafe was opening up in the city center. And it's like, well, no point doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then out of nowhere, another person was, um, okay. And they needed a business partner. I was like, oh yeah. Okay. I need, I need a business. And I've got money and I've got, I can sit in a shop and do that bit. I know I can do that. Mm. Um, so we went into business together and I think that helps is having somebody else where if I was having a crisis of confidence, they would do jobs. Mm. And if they were having a crisis of confidence. I could be doing jobs. Um, probably took another year from there. Cause again, two people who we weren't very well driven. There are people always say business owners are really well driven. They're all desperate to get ideas done. Like bollocks, are we? Some of, some of us are just, it's like, we just don't want to work for another person, which yeah. really, really bad at energy, enthusiasm and 
um, sticking, sticking to what we need to do. Fast forward a year and a half later and out of nowhere, that business relationship really soured. People say business is business, but it's just, it's just a dickish way to look at it, to be honest. Mm. There's a human and an emotional component to everybody and everything. Mm. So was yeah. that, you, you went into that and that was just, so that was your COVID experience. Yeah. I basically had a, a one more breakdown, really. I didn't really leave my bed. And I mean, the hair I've got now, as an example, I used to have really long, luscious locks and mm. like my hair was down past my shoulders. Um, but from the stress of it all, I'm, I was just losing clumps of hair. It's just like the stress of it all and the breakdown was mm. fucking horrendous. Um, so I ba barely left my bed and if I did, I never left the house. I mean, you couldn't really that much over COVID, but people were going for walks, people were going for bike rides. And I was like, yeah, I just can't be fucking bothered. I just got yeah. no energy, no enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember how it came about maybe, maybe around, cause obviously the lockdown stuff really kicked in around April time. Mm. And probably around July that my wife said, I'm sick of this now, Ian. You obviously want to carry on doing a business like this. Why don't you just have one more look to see what there is available? Mm. Talk to a few people. So you make, you make connections. I mean, I've helped, we were helping, I was helping other shops around Leeds set up. So mm. one in Garford, one in Armley, there, there was one in Armley, there's one in Chapel Allerton, mm. there's one in Horsford. Helping, helping them all set up. Um, it's like, you've got some connections, why don't you see what you can make out of those connections? I was like, all right, okay. Do it for you because you've, you've, she's had to deal with me having mental breakdowns every single day for a month. I know with that at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. and then yeah, out of nowhere ended up in high pack. I don't even really know how that happened. I was just kind of like tapping away on, um, on the internet and this shop suddenly became available. Like it wasn't mm. even like I was searching for a shop mm. it said, oh, by the way, you might be interested in this shop on high pack corner. What? You know what? I'm kind of numb. I went all yeah. for that. <laughs> and then ended up moving in April this year. So April 2021. Wow. So it's literally from this year and just a, a few months. So how's it been going? It's sort of the comeback from lockdown and. Uh, it's been, it's been a way because the experience I'm having is it because it's a food retail shop. Mm. Food retail hasn't been hit the same as everybody else during lockdown. Yeah. yeah. Everybody still needs food mm. and everybody's still interested in the plastic free experience. Mm. Um, and because I'd set up just towards the end of it, the, the, the bigger drop for me is when the students go home. So I'm yeah. in the middle of all the students. Yeah, yeah. And so lockdown, yeah, it will have affected sales. I'm not going to lie and say it's had no effect, mm. but that's the experience I've found is it's not necessarily lockdown is my problem, but it's mm. the student population mm. and the general migration of students. So for eight months of the year, that's great. But for four months, I'm close to being better shut. Mm. And the only reason why I still open up the shop over the summer is to get away from my kids for a few hours. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. They've definitely got their energy levels from me. Yeah. And it's just nonstop. So yeah. Why I keep the shop open over the summer? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so as you say, going back to kind of setting up the shop and making those connections, and then coming back, you know, from that bad experience, and then setting up a new shop. Um, I mean, there must be there must be new opportunities that arise from being in a shop. I mean, I, I would imagine, even though you've got or what could be considered kind of a transient sort of uh, demographic in terms of students coming into the city and leaving the city. You know, a lot of students stay and a lot of people, you know, as the business is there for longer, some of those people that do stay will be returning customers and so on. And other opportunities could come from that. So what, what do you see for the future of the shop? I mean, the, it sounds like you ha you you'd be a person that would have ideas for it, but you're not necessarily going to realise them straight away. Yeah, um, it's like things I want to do in the future. I want to like host a whole zero waste festival on like Woodhouse Moor and where mm. 
um, with live music, I don't know, something where um, people have to be riding bicycles to power the electricity of the stage. Mm. Um, the food is all, um, there's no waste of the food and it's all grown locally and it's all made locally. And for people buying drinks, they buy a ticket and be given like a, a pint of steel cup, mm. pint steel cup for all their drinks they can take home and whatnot. But like you say, it's, I've had this idea for years. Will it ever materialize? If there's anybody out there who, who wants to take on that idea, they're more than welcome to. Because I don't think I'm going to realize it for at least another five, six years, if mm. not. Um, it took a lot of brain space and energy just to set up a shop, never mind a whole festival. Mm. And I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to people about it. I'm always willing to mm. make a connection there. But yeah, and say it's, I've got ideas for the shop to be bigger and shop to be moved on, have a second shop, have a stand. Mm. And then my brain goes, Ian, that, that's a lot of work. Don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, that, that's exactly. when we all need that secretary or that someone that's like, make it happen. Uh, yeah. Apparently, I heard with Richard Branson, he used to be like, you know, just the ideas guy who was like, I want to do this. And apparently, it was his roommate at college with, that was the one that was like, okay, well, let's realize that then. So, you know, like, so he was the one that was just going, I want to do this. And the other guy's like, well, let's make it happen. I think you need that person, don't you? Yeah, I need that person, but there's a great example that Richard Branson was the ideas guy. Mm. We only know of Richard Branson. We don't know about the guy who put the hard work and effort in. I'll yeah. tell you what, that would <laughs> piss me off if everybody went, oh, Ian, you're amazing. I'd be like, I haven't done, fucking done anything. <laughs> it's weird. People say to me, do you want to make money in business? I'm like, no. Some people are making the money great for them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I just couldn't do it with myself. It's like, why do I hire staff for People saying you need staff members. I'm like, but then they'll be doing all the work. Mm. But then I'll be redundant. And we go, yeah, that's great. You don't have to work for your money. I'm like, no, but that, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to be that multi millionaire billionaire who mm. messes. I'm trying to not swear so <laughs> It's fine. It's fine to swear. Squash the little man, as it were. Just the. Make me some money. Yeah. Oof, let's be shivered just thinking about it. So what jobs were you doing before you, you took this route to, to go into so, business for yourself? So I was just looking over it. I was like, I'm the kind of business owner I can literally see the communist manifesto that I bought myself for my birthday last year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get through that book. Some big, <laughs> I find myself on Google searching out the words. But it's an interesting read. But yeah, I just yeah, I've not I couldn't have seen it. Yeah, people say, have you got any ideas for like expanding in second shops? And it's like, not really. I'll happily give people the information and the ideas for them to set up a shop so that yeah. they can make them there. But why would I then open up a second shop and me make all the money when I've got enough money to survive on? I don't need more money. Um, I mean, it helps having a wife who's, she's happy to be paid a lot of money. She's, she's paid enough for us to survive on. It's, this is just a hobby, essentially. Mm. I mean, it's a paid hobby. It's not a well-paid mm. hobby. Mm. Um, myself a grand a month. I mean, it's better than some companies. Yeah. Um, but I've said, I just can't bring myself to pay me more, even if it's a good month. It's like, yeah. Donate to charity. I randomly sponsored one of my friends who plays for Wakefield Ladies Football Club. Mm. It's like, I'm a company in Leeds sponsoring a football club in Wakefield. Like, why am I doing it? I had a bit of extra money that month. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, you're kind of, in a lot of ways, you could be in this really good position of like, um, you know, being online and being eco-friendly and, and all of that kind of stuff. But your whole thing is sort of non-plastic packaging. So it's not like you can send stuff out to people. That's sort of not in line with your business, is it? It's not. And so it's, I see a lot of people, uh, they do deliveries and they've all got vans for the deliveries on cars for the deliveries. It's like, I, I, I do my deliveries on a, an electronic bicycle mm. just tootling around on this, uh, e-bike that I've got. I mean, I've gone out to Wakefield to do deliveries before and that, that was cold, mm. I mean, the lovely views, but it was raining, miserable, good fun. 
Um, and yeah, because the energy supply we use is ecotricity, which is all this hundred um, percent electricity and hundred percent renewable gas and mm. whatnot. It's like, so, oh yeah, we'll plant trees as well, and it'll be carbon negative. Uh, but yeah, it, it, good fun doing those deliveries. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's, uh, so how, what sort of roles were you doing before you started the shop then? Oh, uh, I mean, I could almost reel off all my jobs. There's such a wide range of randomness. Were so you going first... through them quickly because you didn't like them or you, you were just like, they were short term contracts or. No, it was again, it's, it's just how my brain works. It's like, yeah. I've had a job for a year and I'm like. I'm not progressing. I'm bored. Bye. It's like, it's, it, again, it's that having to constantly keep my brain busy. If my brain stops being busy because it's got used to what it's doing. Mm. Like, just shuts down. Like, I mean, so I worked in my grandma and my auntie used to run, used to have a sweet shop in my local village. Mm. So I used to work there. Um, I think that kept me occupied. So I got to dress up as all the characters in the fancy dress department and stand mm. outside waving at everybody. That was fun. Um, <laughs> And then, I mean, I worked at Royal Mail for a bit in like the big depot over in Normanton. All right. Fun. I mean, I'm originally from Castleford, so it was, it was a lot closer back then than it is now. Mm. And, um, so yeah, I used to work there. Then I think when I left university, I took a call center job at Santander mm. and a police liaison unit. That was fun. Told them I did a law degree. They thought I was a good person at law now. I got a third because I wrote most of the answers on my hand. It's interesting how many, <laughs> like you can get three, three rows of answers on each finger. Yeah. And you just go to town on the palm of your hand. Just to cough. It's like every exam I suddenly had this bad cough where I could just be like, oh, yes, yes, that's what I was thinking. Blah, blah, blah. It's that writing. I still only got a third, even with all that cheating. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, it's fine. I'm not actually representing anybody in court, so I don't feel guilty about it. Yeah. If I, if I was like before, if I wanted to be a radiographer and I cheated for all my exams, then I'm yeah. cacking it right now. If I was a radiographer, <laughs> um, yeah. So that was it. Yeah. Worked at police liaison unit Santander. Then I took a job at Ladbrokes. How is that? Were you in the shops or were you? Yeah, I was in the, the shops. Officers. Yeah. I have to go like the, the staff were great, made some good friends. I mean, you're all in the same shitty boat there everybody gets what's going on but you, you just watching people lose their livelihoods yeah one one time that sticks out in my head was I, we were just sat, sat in the shop minding our own business a guy comes up to us a brown paper envelope you always know it's bad when somebody comes in with an unmarked brown paper envelope mm. and he just goes life savings six grand next favorite like, what the actual fuck have you just done um, and he's like, I've had a tip. It's my life savings. I've been told it's going to win. Um, this is going to make me 20 grand. Like, sure, mate. Yeah. <laughs> that th these are living and breathing horses that can't understand what you're saying. Nobody can really explain to a horse that they have to win. Um, so where they're counting it. And I mean, it's six grand in 50 pound notes still takes a while to count. Mm. So you're just counting away. And after about four grand, it's like, oh, right, the race has started. And you kind of still counting money, but you're glancing up at the fix. A 20 grand win, you're happy mm. for that. But that, mm. that's beyond what you could. So you've got to like go to a bank. You've got to fill in all these special forms. Mm. Um, and after about halfway through the race, I'm like, where's the favorite? It's like, is it really far in the lead that you can't see it? Has he actually caught on to a winner here? Yeah. You find out it fell at the first hurdle. God. And you can see this person just, they broken because they've just lost their life savings off of this random tip. Yeah. And you're counting their 50 pound notes in front of them to make yeah. sure that you, you've got all six grand. And the worst thing was, they were giving us six grand and 50 quid, so we had to give him 50 quid back. Oh, it's like, we, we just killed this person. I mean, Insult to injury. Emotionally killed this person. Yeah. I mean, they have gone into the shop and they have, they willingly paid the money, but. Mm. There's always that guilt that you could always have just said, no, it's not your yeah. business. Ladbrokes aren't going to miss that six grand. But that person, that was their life. And I should, I look back on it and go, should I just said no? My whole life is about saying yes, say yes to life. 
somebody asked me if I want to go on an activity. I'm like, yes. Somebody asked if I want to learn this thing. Yes. Yeah. But that was the moment where it's like, shit, I should have just said no. Why, yeah. why is it such a hard word to say? Why was I trying to please somebody I've never met before? I'm not getting a bonus off it. But again, well, I mean, they could have just gone into the shop or, you know, if you'd not counted it in time for the race, they could have gone on another race, you know, just because they were like, oh, well, I missed that tip. You never know. Yeah, but the selfish part of me then is going, it's not my problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that story is going to live with me forever. That person's have lost all their life savings forever. And I mean, like I said, lap ducks didn't turn around. They actually put me in a disciplinary a month later because I apparently didn't ID somebody who I knew was over 18 because I physically knew them. Yeah. They were a secret shopper. Yeah. So I had to say, he never ID'd me. I'm like, I physically knew the guy. He's in my year at university, 22. He didn't need ID and went, well, you should have ID'd him. But, but I physically knew the guy. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there was just, so that was, it was a surreal experience because that is just one, that's the one that always sticks with me in my memory. Mm. But there were people doing that 10 times a day, mm. just over smaller amounts to be putting a hundred quid here to a hundred quid there, a hundred yeah. quid here. And eventually yeah. over the day, they've lost six grand. Yeah. Or they've gained 50 quid, a hundred quid to then spend the next day. But yeah. Yeah. If that someone's in every day, I mean, yeah, if someone's in every day, I mean, how, how much is that going to take before it's, you know, six grand? Not much. Well, no, um, I was, so yeah, so you know, for a bit and it was, it was a similar thing, you know, like you would see people I, and I think sometimes the win is the worst thing for someone because they win big on something, they get lucky and then that, that gets the, the hooks in because it's like, oh, well, I won big, I can do it again. Yeah. Did you ever get those people who are like, I'm going to assist them? You're like, <laughs> what the fuck are you going about? Because it landed on 16 last time. So it means it's either going to land on 16 again, 22 or four. Yeah. Like it's a random number generator. Like literally it could be any random number. No, but I've got a system. No, no, you don't. <laughs> the only system I've ever heard of that is foolproof. And even then it's still got an element to it is where you put a pound on black then you put two pound on black then four pound on black. Yeah. And whenever black comes in, you'll be a quid up. But if red comes in five times, you've got to spend 128 quid. You have to be a quid up. <laughs> you're like, by the time that you've done that five times, the casino's cottoned on and you're bad. Yeah. You've made five quid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I mean, when you talk about the win and the win being a good one, I mean, there was one time where we absolutely, we, we loved the big win. I don't know if anybody will remember, but in Bradford as well, George Galloway came to town on one of the elections mm. and he was running in like Bradford West or something. He loved it around there. Mm. He was just talking complete shine out of his ass. And I remember thinking he's hundred, he was physically a hundred to one to win in mm. his election. Mm. You could tell them something by being in that area. You were like, these are people making the odds in London. They mm. don't understand what's happening. And even us as staff members were like, this is tempting. It's a hundred to one. And one guy did come in and per se, what's your maximum you'll take on George Galloway to win? And we, you tip tap in away and he says, I can take two grand. I'm like, right, okay, I'll do two grand. So we put two grand down. And what we didn't realize was this guy had gone around every, every shop makers in Bradford. Mm. And we're talking, there's 20 of them, 20 of them, a hundred to one at two grand. God, election night, that was tense. Like we were, we were, because this was a somebody who had never bet before. Yeah. This wasn't like somebody who was doing the big win to chase losses or anything. Yeah. They'd just accidentally cottoned on that George Galloway was bound to win yeah. at a hundred to one. And he had at least 30 grand on a hundred to one. Um, and then the day after all the managers were like calling each other. It was like, it was like one of those sales fires. Everybody's calling each other like, oh my God, have you got like 50 grand in your shop? I'm like, yeah, no. Why? Because the same guy has just cleared us out as well. Yeah. Um, so like the head honcho of the whole of like William Hill was in Bradford trying to sort this out at one point because oh they, they shed loads of money on it. Mm. And it's, it's just not reported on because politics is never, you, they'll never recoup that money. Politics no. is such a small betting market, mm. but yeah, we, we liked that as, as, regular staff members it was funny to watch the big hit 
the big honchos coming up from London to lowly Bradford to sort out an issue because of George <laughs> Bloody Galloway. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, after that, I actually um, took a bit of a, kind of stayed in sport and moved on to working at Leicester University in the okay. sports department. Mm. And for me at the time, that was a dream job, dealing with students, getting mm. to go out drinking with the students twice a week mm. and playing sport, like literally mm. playing sport and then administering it. Mm. Like just organizing their transport and fixtures. That was lovely. Yeah, but there was a big departmental change about a year and a half in mm. um, where they were basically moving people around, firing people, forcing people to get new jobs so they could merge loads of departments. Mm. Um, and I couldn't, it was at a point where student politics was just insane as well. Mm. Um, and luckily my wife got pregnant like that month. So I quit that job, um, mm. sort of back up to Leeds, um, where her job was. Mm. Um, and then there was stay at home dad for quite, for two years. So, cause obviously we did that whole thing of who makes the most money, Rachel. Yeah. So after Rachel's maternity, it's like, well, I'm going to be the stay at home dad. Just made sense. Mm. Uh, that was probably the best non-paid job I've ever had in my life. I was going to say, how was that? Oh, I absolutely loved it. It's got to go to Ubika five days a week. Right? <laughs> and here's, here's the kicker. <laughs> I was there that lot, that many times. There was a point where it was like, Imogen, what do you want to do? You want to go to Eureka? Sod it. It's like a 20-minute walk into town. Mm. A five-pound train fare. And the ticket is for all year. So it's like spending five pound a day and still getting to go to Eureka. Um, after about six months of doing that, the manager just walked up to, walked up to us and went, do you really like Eureka this much? Like, <laughs> yeah, flipping love it. My kids don't decide to come here. It's me deciding to. Like, well, we're about to start applying for jobs. Do you just want a job here? So it's a job at Eureka. Thanks. <laughs> So it's just like, you're here five days a week anyway. I just want to get paid to be here. Like, sure. Yeah. Like, yeah, I worked at Eureka for a year. Um, and I think the issue with that was, uh, it's, this one's a really hard one to explain. Mm. Um, and I'll give it a go. But I was a 28-year-old male working predominantly with 16, 17, and 18-year-old females. Mm. So it was a very, we, we were very different culturally to be new, but also I'd just be saying stuff that meant nothing to me. Like, oh yeah, your hair looks nice today. Just as a random, like thinking of a conversation topic to say. And to me, that was just, your hair is a nice shade of red because you've dyed it. Mm. Whereas what they were hearing was, you're talking about my hair, you're noticing me. That's weird. You're old. I'm like, no, didn't mean it like, so it was, it was very weird behind the scenes to be in that situation. Yeah. yeah. Like, Awkward. Yeah. And again, it's that, never, didn't know it at the time, but again, if it had known about the ADHD back then, it would have made a lot more sense. Yeah. I couldn't read a room. I'd walk in and be like, I, I could notice like, like say the, the dyed hair one is like, I noticed you've dyed your hair. You've mm. dyed your hair and I've noticed it. So I should mm. mention it to say, nice hair otherwise why would you have dyed it mm. but obviously then it was yeah so and it, it, in the end i ended up quitting that job just because i was spending more time panicking about how i was acting and saying around that yeah than enjoying dealing with the kids yeah and being a stay-at-home dad for two years my social skills just were down the pan with that yeah. i could do i could communicate like a boss with anybody under the age of five yeah I put me in a room full of five-year-old kids and all of them singing and dancing. You've got the energy for that. But put me in a room full of teenagers. It's like, what the hell am I meant to talk about? Mm. What am I meant to do? Mm. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was a lovely, that was the best job I've ever had for the physical job. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it just, if I'd have had that job 10 years earlier, it would have been perfect. Yeah. I think, cause then we would have been more on the same wavelength and Obviously, there'd been there'd have been completely different issues, probably. Mm. Um, but it, it wasn't issues where I was thinking, "Oh my God, they think I'm a weird perv." Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, so obviously, then left that job and ended up working in 
Breeze, the Leeds Council, um, for right, kids' yeah. activities, mm-hmm. which that, that was better because that was like, so the, the age range wasn't as bad. There, there were more people my age mm-hmm. and there were actors. So when you would say something to them like, oh, did, I'm going to use the example of you've cut your hair. It looks nice. They, they understood that where I was coming from with that was more, yeah. you've noticed my hair's been cut. Yeah. Um, because that, that's just what you, we do with the, so and, that's, that was a much better, um, emotionally to not have to worry about that aspect of the, the age difference. And yeah. Coming difference. across wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it was working with being a Santa, being an elf. I mean, if there's any kids listening, I was helping Santa, um, <laughs> not being Santa. I shouldn't have said that. I'll start again. Um, <laughs> so it was wonderful helping Santa and, uh, helping the elves, um, from the North pole, mm. um, for a few years. I just kind of quit that, that, that one was only really because I wasn't going anywhere with it. Mm. Um, there's only so many years I can play the same elf over and over again before the ADHD. Now, I mean, I'm loving the job, but it's not, it's not peaking my brain as much as it used to. So time for a new challenge, mm. um, which yeah. is then where, where I ended up. So I think from there, that is when I then ended up getting into running my own business. So was that, was that sort of an idea that was burning in your back pocket the whole time, or was it just something that never, like it was there as something that you wanted to do, but didn't really come up until that point? It was something I'd always wanted to do. Yeah. It was always on that bucket list. Mm. I've still got it somewhere in my memory box. I've got a whole shelf now of them. Um, and the, it, so it was always there. It was never something I thought about. It was only when my auntie died. And I was literally like, what? You've left me that much? Mm. Shit, what, what am I spending that on? What am I even, what am I even going to do with that amount of money? It's like, it wasn't mm. like it was massive amounts, but it, it, it was five figures. Mm. It, it was enough to be like, I've never, ever experienced this amount of money in my life. Mm. And it, it was like, before I just burn it on gambling and blackjack and whatnot. It's like, mm. okay, let's put it into something useful first. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a life-changing amount, isn't it? It's that, you know, I, I mean, anything can be a life-changing amount depending on your circumstances, but that's like, you know, like you say, if you've never seen, even seen that much money before, it's like, oh, what now? I can't complain about yeah. things as much. But it was like, you, you just like, before I lose it all, because it says how, uh, I've, I've met, I've met people who've been given that amount of money through inheritance before, mm. and they've just shot till they dropped. I mean, the money's gone. What yeah, left yeah. with nothing materials that and film, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And it's like, you could have bought a house, some stability, a business, anything mm. with that. And you've just been shopping over and over and over again, granted over like five years. Yeah. Uh, so five years of doing what they wanted to do, but that's it. It's gone now. Mm. And it was like, I didn't want to go down that route. So it's like, yeah, okay. I've got to find something I can at least invest it into that'll last longer. Yeah. I, I went down the route of spending. I'd, I'd already bought a house, then I sold the house, and I was like, the house was a pain. <laughs> so, I want to go and do some stuff. So I ended up spending it all and doing stuff instead. Um, yeah. But now I'm here. So, you know, like you say, you don't have anything to show for it. Well, I'm just starting this, so yeah. <laughs> trying to build back. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's go on to, we've covered COVID a little bit. I mean, is there anything more that you want to say about kind of the, the lockdown and stuff with the, I think we kind of covered it, didn't we? Oh, we've, yeah, well, we've covered what, what I did for all that period. I mean, mm. it, it was, oh, done, it's gone frozen again. Yeah, yeah, I've just done that a couple yeah, of times. It was, it was just a crazy time. And mm. I do remember just looking at some of the numbers and some of the things people were saying, and I was just like, what the hell is, that I know all humans are different and whatnot. We all have different viewpoints, but sometimes I was just sitting there thinking, how have we got to this point? Mm. How have we become si- so diverged as a population that, I mean, God, what, for, for one big example, the one I, I lost so many friends down the rabbit hole. Mm. How did so many people get dragged into QAnon? Where did that come from? How did it become such a big thing? And like, I remember one of my friends posting about how all these big celebrities mm. are being replaced by robots. 
Mm. I mean, you could even read the list. You could tell the person who made the list were just watching TV shows. I mean, at the top of the list was the cast of Friends. And then underneath it was like the cast of The O.C. And then underneath it was like the cast of E.R. And then something was the Queen. So there's obviously watched the Queen's speech in between E.R. and the next thing. I thought my friend was honestly believing this. Mm. Like, d- did COVID really make us that crazy that because we were just stuck inside all day, we were going to all this stuff? I think it's some of that, yeah. And some of it's kind of, you know, I mean, the previous few years and generally, like, you know, you told one thing and then it's not true. Or, <laughs> or you know, I so lizard men living under the, the planet, though. I mean, th- there's a limit to how much is you get told something and it's not true or that's just batshit insane. I'm sorry if you are a believer in lizard people living under the planet, but it's not my viewpoint at all. I mean, <laughs> really? Ugh. Anyway, yeah. And yeah, it's just, just a crazy time, wasn't it, COVID? I mean, mm. it's still going. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like, uh, I might just be because I've caught those people up in my life, but I feel like people are not as not as taken in anymore. I know there's still people who are saying vaccinate, unvaccinate, blah, 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 but that seems to be the main argument now. It's not, are there lizard people or fair yeah. robots running around? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it seems to have tapered off from the absolute insane to like, I've, I, that, it's really weird. I've, I've known people who are vaccinated and are who are unvaccinated. I personally am vaccinated. I think we all do. And yeah, but some of the arguments are, okay, I don't agree with that argument, but I can see where you're coming from. Mm. Like, I know pregnant people who are who have refused to get vaccinated, mm. um, and they've been told it's completely safe. Mm. But also, you're dealing with an unborn life here, mm. and it hasn't, it hasn't, this vaccine, I know it, the base of the vaccine has been yeah, yeah. for decades, yeah. it's like COVID-19 now, and it's, but I mean, you don't want to risk an unborn life on something that the vaccine's only been around a year. Mm. Babies are only just being born now. Mm. And you don't know their long-term side effects. I mean, we watched called a midwife and there was a big drug in the eighties that was to cure morning sickness. Mm. Then babies were being born with deformed and missing limbs. Mm. I mean, you get told it's safe. And I get this where conspiracies come from, isn't it? But mm. so I can see their argument and I'm like, Fair play. Please don't have a go at me for being vaccinated when you're unvaccinated. But I can see where you're coming from. Mm. I wouldn't, well, I would fucking hate to be in that decision where I've got to pick a vaccination mm. and the unborn child and mm. not 100% knowing the health risks mm. to that. And it's like, but people then say, what about the flu vaccine? Are you going to say that? And it's like, well, the va- flu vaccine's been around for decades. It's yeah, yeah. At, at least a decade. So, so yeah, and so I feel like the arguments now are more people are hating on each other because of those arguments. But when you look at the arguments, they're making much more sense than they were a year ago, mm. when people were just like, "I'm not doing it because I don't want blood coming out my eyes." What the fuck are you want about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to tell. I don't know. Yeah. Cause it does feel like it was, it, it was way crazier than even though it was way calmer, you know, like the streets were quieter, everything was calmer outside, but it seemed like everything was a bit more chaotic. Yeah. But now it seems yeah. a bit quieter, but yeah. Yeah. Rain. It was just like, yeah, everybody. <laughs> I mean, it was just us being left alone with our own thoughts. And that's just, just, oh no, we've all gone, we've lost our minds. Yeah. It makes me w- glad for we weren't having a fucking brexit vote during lockdown mm. imagine how crazy the arguments would have got then they were bad enough mm. as it was mm. on both sides i mean i i will i will admit i was i didn't even vote in the end i just don't mm. with it anymore mm. just so many accusations coming from both sides i'm like i'm out i i'm, I'm not doing it anymore and i ended up i was actually so uh, as a side story during that vote I was actually at a world championships for ultimate Frisbee and I was representing Belgium of all things. Okay. I got no connection to Belgium at all. The only reason <laughs> being, again, this was back in the inheritance days, mm. um, a big call out went across the whole UK going, 
if you can afford the three hundred pound entry fee, you can play at the World Championships. They're desperate. Mm. I was like, I've got three hundred quid. Okay, yeah, I'm going to London. <laughs> I ended up playing for Belgium. Yeah, um, and just it, it was easy then just to forget the vote was even taking place. I'd already decide, decided by that point. I'm like, I'm just not going to vote. Mm. I mean, I was leaning more towards staying in than leaving, but I still just wasn't. Mm. Not enough for me to go into that polling booth and go 100% stay, definitely. That's uh, it. That's, that was the whole thing. I mean, you know, people were saying that they're surprised. That it was like, to me, it was like, the only people that are going to vote for this are the people who want to leave. You know, nobody else is interested and nobody else will think it will win. The only thing that surprised me was how close it was and the amount of people that actually did turn out for Remain. Yeah. I mean, as soon as it got closer, again, that was because six months before that vote, I'd gone back to Ladbrokes because they were desperate for staff for a few months. Mm. And even in those few months, people were placing bets on Remain winning by 30 points. Mm. By the time I'd left, bets were being placed and it'd been a dead heat. Mm. It was that close even then. I think that's when everybody started panicking and going, oh, shit, even the yeah. bets are going. It's yeah. going to be a dead heat. <coughs> It's weird being in bookies. You can almost predict the feeling of the population, just mm. not where the bets are being placed. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I do remember waking up, and I, obviously, as an undecided voter, I, I shouldn't have felt guilt on either side. But when I saw that victory gloat from Nigel Farage, I was like, "Oh fuck! I've helped this happen by not voting. What have I done?" <laughs> So I did have a bit of buyer's remorse on that one, but again, I've got to, I've got to admit it and I've got to stick by it. I mean, I hate those people who, if they've picked the wrong horse or they've picked the wrong idea, they've got to own up to it. And I hate people who don't, I, I will say I am, I was an undecided. I wouldn't be this time, but yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's uncommon these days. I mean, I remember sort of during my lockdown rants, walking with people, um, talking about there seems to be this perception within media at the moment that people just can't admit that they're wrong. You know, no one can ever be wrong. It's just, you know, I never said anything wrong. I'll just move on to saying something else. So yeah, I think that's important to be able to just go, well, yeah. Uh, and to be able to admit that you got bamboozled or, you know, if you, if you get bamboozled, then it's like, yeah, they, they got me. It, they're sophisticated, multi-billion, multi-million pound operations that, that work, which is why they spend the money on them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and both sides were like that. And it's, I mean, again, it's the ADHD. So it was very colorful with both sides of the argument. It was just like my brain just couldn't cope anymore. Like, poof, it's gone. What, what, what happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it a... Well, I've got a question on Brexit generally. So, uh, I, I mean, is it affecting the shop at all? Is it affecting your suppliers? Is it having any effect on the businesses yet? Uh, it's weird. On the actual physical business, I'm going to say no, because it's not really affected the amount of students going to lead to university yet. Mm -hmm. um, and again, until those numbers go vastly up or down, mm. um, I'll, I'll never know. So I'm going to say in terms of actual physical customers, no, mm. in terms of stock, I am noticing price increases, mm -hmm. um, but only on certain products, which I yeah. don't know if that's because of Brexit or that's because of a bad harvest. I mean, like at the moment, Brazil nuts, can't get yeah. enough of the price rises on them. Woo, have a party with that. Nearly tripled in price in the past five months. Yeah. And can that be attributed to the hard border of Brexit or can it be attributed to Seville? So I don't really know. Mm. Um, I know there's supply issues in what, what I sell, but mm. that's because there's more zero waste shops. I can't tell if that's a Brexit thing or not. Mm. In terms of business, I'm going to say no, I don't think I'm, I'm with a, obviously I'm, I'm put, I'm leaning more towards, I don't think it's actually affecting me at all. Yeah. Ten, yeah. But I am also a very, very small player. In a very, very small pond mm. where my fluctuations are more 100 quid here, 100 quid there, not mm. the millions of pounds people like Asda and Sainsbury's are dealing with. Mm. And they're, they're mitigating factors of having 50 million lorry drivers 
up and down the country at any one time disappearing all of a sudden. I've not had to deal with that because the company weirdly that do my deliveries to me from my supplier are literally about five doors down from me right now. Mm. Really, really weird. I, I live just on the edge of an industrial estate. And that that them yeah, it's so, so surreal that I could just walk down there and pick up my pallet if I wanted to. Mm. I, I'd have no way of getting that pallet to my shop because I'm also like a 25 minute cycle ride from my shop. Yeah. But yeah. So for me personally, it's not affecting me. I just need one driver in one mm. lobby who's right, who's local to me anyway. It's a local business and mm. local deliveries. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I don't think it has in society, Brexit, uh, I'd, I'd say COVID has, has hit more. Some, some of the, yeah, Brexit brought out the worst in people, but I felt like we were still able to be civil. Like I can always mm. be civil with somebody I disagree with mm. to a certain extent. And they can say Brexit was the best thing that ever happened. I'd be like, I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to hate you for it. Mm. But COVID, I mean, I, I, the fact that QAnon became a big thing during lock, uh, lockdown, it's like, I feel like that's affected society more with conspiracy theories like that. Mm. Yeah, so I feel like that that's affected society more. Mm. But again, just a small town player. So what is it? Small town girl in a small town world. I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know the right words to the song. That's what's singing in my head right now. You know, it's a lonely girl in a lonely world, isn't it? I mean, I'm changing it completely to small town girl in a small town world. Um, <laughs> Mixing it up with Billy Joel. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's like who, who cares? Eh? Well, not who cares. Obviously, it's affecting people elsewhere, but I, I don't think I've felt much of a much of an effect, as it were, from Brexit. Mm. I mean, I'm having to listen to politicians all screaming at each other. Mm. But yeah, but they even seem to have kind of moved on from that. They just well, they did, but then it seems like I don't know whether they brought it back because they think it's a good sort of issue to distract people with, or or it's biting them on mm. the bum or whatever. But it's kind of like it went away, and then it was like we had the whole COVID thing and. To some degree, it seemed like the public were kind of relieved to hear a new, constantly rotating story. And then all of a sudden, yeah, then it came back for a bit, didn't it? Because we're going to get rid of the hard border. Yeah. Um, And then it's disappeared again because of Peppa Pig world, of all things. What the hell is going on there? I was trying to explain it to her. So the the lady who babysits my kids and I babysit hers just as a, a, a tit for tat. With with your prime minister, huh? Oh, I lost Hello? you again. You froze again. Have I frozen? Oh, we're, we're done. So just oh, you're back now. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just saying. So I have a, a babysitter that looks after my kids, and I look after hers. Um, and she's from Spain, and she's got a friend who's also Spanish living with her. I'm not going to turn up one day to pick up my kids, and their response was just like, "What the hell is going on with your prime minister? Like, you know what? I don't even have a clue." Like I love pretending I have an interest in politics and I follow it mm. enough that one of my, you know, like you get those when you first bring up your search page and it mm. comes up with eight tabs, your most yeah. tabs. One of them is a polling company that I follow on Twitter. I mean, I actually really get into all this stuff. And even I'm just like, he's lost the plot. And they go, is he always like this? I'm like, to an extent, Boris Johnson is always an idiot. And that's why people like him and see i don't get that i if i if i want a prime minister i don't want a prime minister who bumbles on and on and on but some people do fine that's up to them mm. but then when you're in a meeting with the some of the biggest players in business and your mm. party is known as the business party to then literally lose your notes for so long to mm. pretend you're a car going vroom 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 alert, and then talk about peppy pig world i'm like Honestly, I feel like he's having a breakdown. Well, you do see, see like five minutes to now. It's well, you do see with these people that that go into into office, like as much as it's a cushy job and they're doing this, that, and the other. You do see them like visibly age and stress in those roles. Like it's a short period of time, but when they go in and when they come out, they look completely different. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd like Boris. Boris was a shambles beforehand, but he's only what been doing the job for like 
nearly two years or something. He's fallen yeah. apart completely. Because this act, this act is gone and it is an act. You talk oh, yeah. to anybody who knows him, who's met him in private and he's a proper politician. He just in public is an idiot to, to look like a normal person. Mm. And he's very good. He's been doing that for decades. Mm. So there's definitely something going on now where he's suddenly snapped and mm. he's losing the plot. And that, mm. that's worrying. Not, not from a, there's always people who take over. Mm. From, from a human to a human perspective, mm. I'm worried he's going through a breakdown and there's kids involved. Mm. The last thing I want is for him to absolutely lose the plot. And I just think somebody, like, I know the reporter did it. As, not as a joke, but he was doing it for effect. But mm. I do want somebody just to sit down and go, are you okay? Mm. Do you want to just take a day where you can just sit in a room and cry if you need to? Mm. You know, something like that will just help massively. Mm. Human yeah. to human. I don't care about the politics of it anymore. But there's, there's just been certain things where I'm looking at it and going, no, no, please, please stop. Just to, I don't care about this whole having to look powerful anymore. Just please stop for a day. I, I kind of know what you mean. So um, this is this is another tangent. But I, I was at festival when Amy Winehouse was there. Yeah. And my God, it was like, this woman should not be on a stage. She should be in a hospital bed. Like, mm. the, the band were all amazing and stuff and really tight and, you know, really professional. And she came out and it was like, she's not well. She needs to not be here, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's... It, it, really kind of it, well it's kind of a bit like it, it's watching something tragic that you feel like you can't do anything about mm. sort of thing yeah bring it um, to my random guy who lost his life savings that's what i was thinking of yeah <laughs> it's like you you really need to step in and say no enough yeah. is enough just just please look after yourself mm. but you feel like you don't have the power to do so mm. Like, I mean, you're just one person in a crowd. I mean, I'm just one person out of millions watching this car crash happen. And it's like, I just, just mm. I don't have the power to just ask him, just please stop. But yeah. Is that the book you do? Yeah. Yeah. It's strange. I think, you know, to some degree, there's a shift there, you know, shifting how you approach customers and so on. Cause like, if I think of old, old British movies, I can definitely recall sort of, you know, people in shops having an attitude of like, oh no, you can't have that. And you can't, you can't do this. And it's like, no one in a shop who works in a shop now would feel that they'd ever have the ability to say no to a customer. It's just like, oh, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. The customer is always right. Definitely. That's what they say, isn't it? No, work, that not worries me, but, um, I think back, I can imagine if I was running a shop in America and I said no to a customer and they just pulled out a gun on me. Mm. That, that's, I know that was a complete, a complete tangent there in my head, but I was thinking <laughs> that then when you were saying, don't say no to a customer, I'm like, oh shit, what happens if I get stabbed? Mm. Got me worried about my own shop now. <laughs> worried about it before. Now I'm going to go in there and be panicking as soon as a customer comes in my face. I'm like, oh no, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> you should be fine. You've been fine so far. Uh, uh. <laughs> That's what they all say until it happens. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, touch wood. Right. So let's go on to something that's should be in your wheelhouse because uh, you're a, you know, an eco friendly sort of shop. I mean, when you even said, what's in my wheelhouse? What is a wheelhouse? You, 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 I'm like, what, what is he on about? A wheelhouse? What is he talking about? I do, that's one thing there. I would like, I'd like to admit is I've got the excuse where. If somebody says a word in business that I don't understand, I'll just say to them, what the hell have you just said? And they'll look at me weird. I'll go, but uh, do you want me to pretend I know what you're on about? And then I yes. awkwardness in the future when I start using that word wrong. I'm like, what yeah. do you mean? Yeah. No, it's best. I, I think it's always best to ask the question. Yeah. It's better to know because otherwise, you, you know, you could spend six years just trying to guess what it is and... I'm pretending. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, there's an example I use. I don't know if I want this used in, in the actual podcast, but when I was a kid, like the meaning of the words, remember there was a song that was like, I'm horny, horny, horny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just came out and asked, asked my dad, like, what does horny mean? 
Mm. I mean, it must have been about seven or eight at the time. He just goes, it means you owe somebody money. So for <laughs> the good 10 years of my life, it never cropped up again. And I just thought it meant it, you owe somebody money. Yeah. And obviously as a student at university, somebody goes up to me, he goes, I'm horny. I'm like, who, who do you owe money to? And they're, they're looking at me like, what are you on about? And I'm like, you owe somebody money. And they're like, no. And I think it was from that moment where I went, I, I just need to, I, I've learned I need to ask. Yeah. What it means if I don't understand, because it'll it, come to bite me on the arse. Exactly. Yeah. It's better to know straight away because, you know, you look boy of a fool in the long window. <laughs> it's home that night because he thought I was an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So because you work in um, a green field, not a green field, like literally. Yeah, literally. Like, there is a green field, field next to the shop. You, you work near a green field and a pub and yeah. a main road. Um, so <laughs> now, I, I'm going to go into the climate question. So you're already being quite mm -hmm. green. I mean, and to a degree it, it, it's built in from the base of your company. Um, I mean, how big a factor was it in creating that company and, you know, and, well, just basically talk about the climate side and sort of what what you wanted to affect and what you can affect and how you feel that it affects your work? Um, I mean, when we're, I had one to answer because when I first wanted to start a business, it was in a board game cafe, which is not exactly known mm. for being very green and eco-friendly. There's a lot of shrink wrap. There's a lot of mm. cardboard and virgin card being used chopping lots of trees down to make all these games. Um, and then it just kind of clicked one day. I think basically once we started using reusable nappies on the, on the eldest, and it was just like, okay, it's important to us that we, we promote what we're doing and mm -hmm. how best to do that, how better to do that than in a retail shop. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there, it kind of snowballed from, Hey, everybody, look, this is how we run our life. Would you like to do it too? And then customers are coming in, you'd be having a discussion with them telling people to go away and not buy any of our products because they can just make it at home, that kind of stuff. Mm. I'd say for me personally, it's more important that people live eco-friendly and come into my shop and buy the products. They're like, why are you buying my product that's come from Brighton? Moon, Moon Cups are made in Brighton, I believe. Mm. Or at least the company is in Brighton. And I said a bad example because you don't just make a Moon Cup. That's a yeah. <laughs> um, toothpaste. So people in our area make their own toothpaste and that's wonderful. It's great. All the ingredients are readily available. Why buy my ready-made paste at £6.50 a tub and you can make your own for a quid. Mm. Um, so it's not about, so from a business perspective, I'm shooting myself in the foot all the time, but mm. eco-friendliness onto other people is way more important uh, to me personally and so to our family as well. I mean, I don't think she can hear me, but I'd, I would hope to think that my wife supports my business decisions in not making as much money as long as we are making that big effort to change people's views. Mm. Um, but obviously it does involve then the products we do get in the shop just requires so much more research and information on them. Mm. And one problem, one problem I have a massive problem with is dog poo bags. There's so many on the market that are advertised as compostable, degradable, mm. mm. fine in water, disappears, and none of it does. None mm. of it does. And people keep coming into my shop and saying, have you got any compostable poo bags? I just want to scream at them. Like, what does compostable mean to you? Mm. It means that it'll disappear with the dog poo. I'm like, you, you put it in your bin, right? Or you mm. put it in a public bin? Mm. And they go, yeah. Oh, well, where does that bin end up? It ends up in a landfill. Mm. Does it compost in a landfill? We go, don't know. It doesn't. Mm. It's the most compostable item in the world. But if it's in a landfill, it doesn't compost. Mm. It physically can. It's, it, it's the way landfills have been made and built. Mm. Just like, yeah. And that's just a roundabout greenwashing now. I've, I've been able to work in 
greenwashing into this. That pisses me off so much. Hey, I've got this new product. It's completely biodegradable. And I say to mm. them, no, they're compostable. I say, oh, is it home compostable? I'm like, what do you mean? It's compostable. Mm. Like, yeah, but immediately there's a difference there. If you say compostable, it means that anybody using this product has to use a very special bin supplier. Like in Leeds, for mm. recycling, will take coffee cups that say they're compostable. That's it. If, you, if it says compostable, it's a coffee cup, put it in your black bin, unless you are using forge recycling or you know somebody using forge recycling because it's not going to compost. Yeah. It'll end up in a landfill and end up in a big pile of stuff and it won't, it won't disappear. It won't turn into mulch or anything like that. It, it's just going to sit there just like a normal regular coffee cup. Yeah. Um, and so I go, is it home compostable? And like, well, it's compostable. Like, well, that means it's not home compostable. So I can't put it in my compost. I have to put it in the black bin. So where, where's the benefit of your product? Yeah. It's compostable. Like if we're going around in a circle now, you're using buzzwords <laughs> that make absolutely make no difference to the planet. Mm. Uh, it does bug me when I say big business trying to get involved in this and they use all those buzzwords. And it's like, oh my God, they're all being dragged in again. Well, I think they start from the, the, you know, they do a redesign from the marketing forward. You know, they don't start with the products. Like they don't think, Let's redesign this product and the whole supply chain and the whole distribution chain. Let's change our marketing. Yeah. And that's uh, there is the problem, isn't it? They're not, they're not looking at the fundamental problem of they're creating the waste in the first place. So let's just not create that waste. Mm. They're just looking at how can we make our company look good to the population? Mm. And how can we keep the public paying for all our externalities and our expenses? Mm. Yeah. I mean, how can we keep pushing the cost on to everyone else? I mean, I saw somewhere that Coke did a big advert about how many kilograms of plastic they'd saved with their new design of bottles. And mm. it was a big number. I mean, I was impressed by the number. It was like seven or eight figures. It's like, oh, mm. that's, that's a lot of plastic. And then you think mm. and go, hang on a second. It's only like 2% of their entire production mm -hmm. that they've saved. And it's like, and then you think about the number that they're not saving and you're like, oh my God, just change, please. Oh my God, mm. change. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, like you say, companies, companies will say anything. It's like politicians, they'll say anything to get your money and your vote, but mm. what's actually happening? Mm. Yeah. Well, that's the key question, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it's very hard to find out because, you know, you, the, all the systems are kind of they're all vying for your attention and for your money, like you say. So, mm. yeah, it's like being stood in a mad market with everything. Just like, yeah, so get, give me your money. Yeah, I'll sell you this. I'll give you this. Just give it to me for free. <laughs> Every way you say. Um, I think that we could probably get uh, quite a lot more out of the the green side and the greenwashing side. Mm. Um, but I want to. I don't want to keep you for ages, and I'm conscious of time, and. I want to move on to the next thing. So yeah. that's going to be UBI. So this will be an interesting one to hear your perspective from, because you kind of, you're kind of already doing it. You know, you, you, you're in a position where you didn't maybe necessarily have to work and yet you, the choice was, I want to work. So uh, my question generally is, um, like, what would you do if there was a universal basic income? If you were paid a sort of flat amount to live off, you know, a living amount each month, would you still work? Don't know. That's a tough question. Um, I mean, what the first day universal basic income gets introduced, I celebrate. Mm. Um, the, the communist in me would be absolutely over the moon. Mm. Um, uh, I think I would, but I probably wouldn't be doing the shop per cent. I mean, there's enough shops and I, if that happened, I would very much be happy to pass the torch on to somebody else mm. and just say, Hey, there's this ready-made shop. Universal basic incomes in now. Do you want to have a go? Yeah. They sell up and I would probably then go into, um, setting up some sort of doing childcare. Mm. I mean, that's, mm. if I could split. If I could somehow combine, so it, the shop I have now mm. with childcare somehow, mm. I'd be in heaven. 
I mean, a baby rolls into my shop in a pram and I'm just like, can I hold it? I'm like, you what? Can I hold your baby? I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, I'll start again. Hi, my name is Ian. I love children. Can I just hold your baby so you can have a rest? <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah, of course. I'm like, yes, I get to hold your baby. That's all that matters. <laughs> um, so yeah, if I could somehow combine the two, that'd be perfect. But if I had to pick one or the other, it's just with childcare, it's, it's weird that obviously there's a lot more stress involved in the setting of it up. And I just couldn't be bothered with that at the time. Mm. There was no worry about losing the income because there was a universal income coming in. Mm. I'd probably start leaning towards wanting to do that instead. Mm. Mm. I've never even thought about it because again, inside I'm just like, why has this not happened yet? But then yeah. I remember there's politicians that are in power now who are politicians and it's never going to happen while they are politicians. Mm. And, and change happens so slowly in this country. When it comes or unless it, it, or unless it has to happen. I mean, you know, when, when it comes down to it, you know, when the red line goes down, they can switch the world off, you know, and print all the money that they ever, you know, more money than you can ever imagine when it comes down to it. Um, oh, yeah, don't get me started on the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the philosophy of money. Like, mm. and I try to teach my six year old to go, what's this? She goes, yeah, it's paper. I'm like, yeah. you know what? That, that's exactly what it is. It's just paper. Why is mm. this worth 20 pounds? I'm going to get out another piece of paper and go, why is this one worth five? Mm. They're both paper. That, that's it. It's like, I could get a machine. That's obviously illegal for me to get a machine, mm. but realistically, there is nothing stopping me getting a machine and printing off a shit ton of money mm. and having lots of money just to give people. Mm. Nothing stopping the government doing that. They'll go, oh, we'll go into debt. Debt to who? Mm. Who are we in debt to? The World mm. Bank? The World Bank's in debt. Everybody's in debt. So who? There's, there's, you could just wipe off the debt. Mm. All it takes is somebody on a computer going, boop, debt's gone. Print more money for everybody. And they go, boop, debt's gone. So there's just, it's just a philosophy of money, isn't it? Why is one paper worth more than the other? It's been a long time since I've had to convert, but like we had one of the strongest currencies in the world at one point. But why? Why? Why is it strong? What makes it strong? Mm. Just go. I want to go to a different country. I mean, <laughs> guns make it strong. Guns make it of all problems, right? Mm. Well, at least cause um, them. Yeah. And they cause them so they can solve them, like money. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's like, <laughs> who, set, who sets the price of anything? Like, I mean, we, we as a population go into a supermarket and go, Ooh, the grapes are two pound. Woohoo! But then who sets that price of two pound? The supermarket. Why have they set their price? They've just met some pointless parameters to make it two pound. Mm. But why is the supplier being paid a pittance? Don't know. There's there's nothing stopping us to go in. Let's pay them an extra ten pence a punny. Not exactly much, is it? Um, but they just don't. Everyone's profit driven. But what what is the profit? I mean, your bank account's just an electronic number, isn't it? That spits out paper money at you. Mm. As somebody who has, I mean, when all the world's banks collapse, somebody who has zero pounds now is the exact same amount. Like, I'm always at war with myself, capitalism and socialism. Mm. Every single day I wake up and go, way, I'm in the shop today, let's make some money. And then it's like, oh, say, what have I become? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's stressing me out now thinking about it. Is your ideal to have the shop as it is, just kind of taking along? Mm hmm. And would you, I mean, you've kind of said as much, would you hate it if it was just really busy and everything was kind of flying out the door before it got in? Uh, like, are you, are you scared of success rather than scared of failure? Maybe it's a different way to put it. I guess it depends on the scale of success. I mm. mean, for the, for the business I'm in, if I'm successful and it's flying out the shelves every single week and I have to turn people away at the door, I mean. I'd more than hope that instead of me doing that for years and years and years, the large supermarkets would then go, well, if he's successful in doing this, we need to start doing this. I mean, this was probably what I was like when I was in the center of Leeds as well. Mm. People were saying, oh, you're really popular. What, what's your plan here? And I was like, well, my plan is for big supermarkets and big companies to run me out of business. Mm. It's more about what, what the end goal is 50, 60 years down the line, not what I pay myself next month. 
Mm. If I pay myself any money, that money goes towards my kids' dance class and swimming classes and gymnastics class. It doesn't really go towards what I do. Mm. Um, and I, um, so yeah, I think that I'm happy with the level I'm at now and I'd be happy with more success. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't want it prolonged. I want it to mm. get to a point where, I mean, even when we're in the city center, somebody from co-op came up to me and said, I'm part of the steering group that we've noticed that all these shops are popping up, um, and you're all pretty successful. Mm. Um, we want to start doing that. Do you mind giving us some advice? I'm like, I would love to give you some advice. Mm. My advice is please undercut me on money, undercut me on the amount that you can sell, please do, and run me out of business. I will happily send people your way. Young mm. ones who are desperate to make the money. It's not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm desperate to look after kids and hold babies. I will happily just be <laughs> drowning in, it sounds really wrong, but I'd rather just have like a baby in each arm going around your beaker <laughs> than sat in my shop trying to make money. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the ideal world. I mean, that's why we've got a third kid on the way now. And I'm like, oh, get to take this one to Eureka now. This is exciting. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you mentioned Eureka a lot. I, I absolutely love, love that place so much. Yeah. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll write to them for some advertising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I think mean, that's, that's the end goal is I just want each supermarket to come up to me and go, what's your advice? Can we do it? Because, I mean, Asda have started doing it in Leeds, haven't they, in Middleton. Yeah. They've been on trial for three years now. I mean, it's a yes or a no by this point. Mm. Is it working? Is it not? If it's not working, how do you make it work? I'm happy to come up to you um, and tell you how to make it work. It's, I mean, there are other zero-waste shop owners around the country, and even in Leeds, who are like, no, I've set up this business. I've put my heart and soul into it. I want it to yeah. continue. Fair play to them. Mm. And it's just, that's just not for me. Mm. Well, and ultimately, if you do want it to be majorly successful, that's, that's the competition that you're going up against. If you, if you, you know, you have chains of these up and down the, you know, up and down the country, then they are going to want to compete with you like very aggressively. Um, yeah, yeah. And they, they don't seem to realize that. Why do they need to be aggressive to me? Mm. I literally say to them, oh, you want to undercut me by 50 pence per hundred mm. grams. Thank you very much. Mm. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll obviously have some customers that stay loyal to me, but it make you more affordable now. And people who couldn't use me because it was too expensive will now go to you. Mm. As they'll say, oh, we're aggressively running you out of business. No, I'm letting you do it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you seem very much like work to live, not live to work. Is that about fair? Oh yeah. No, oh, yeah. definitely. I mean, yeah. I, I have my kids in the shop more often than not, and that's mm. at that work. I like, mm. work looking after them, but I can't really focus on the shop then. It's just that I might as well sack off that day. Customer comes in and I'm rocking in a corner. I'm loving rocking in a corner, but they, they <laughs> know what they, they know that there's kids hiding somewhere. It's got to that point now. They know that there's a kid climbing somewhere where there shouldn't be. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I've just, I've just lost the will to tell them no. <laughs> hey, yeah, definitely work to live, not live to work. I, I mean, I used to used to do that. I mean, I was at Ladbrokes for I'd be like twelve hours a day, six days a week, and great. The pay was more than I'm getting now running my own business. But that was like I was never seeing my partner at the time, who obviously is now my wife. But I couldn't spend proper time with her. Uh, we couldn't move on with our lives. We ne I never got to like, socialize because mm. at the time I was too focused on getting myself out of debt, out of student debt. So mm. yeah, I think I realized very quickly after that, it's like, I need to stop this philosophy and trying to do stuff I enjoy instead. Mm. Yeah. You can chase your own tail for ages of like whatever work-wise and stuff, but it's not you have to, you have to settle it for yourself. I think, don't you? you it has to sit right for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, however much you give, you know, if you're one of those workaholic people that wants to do a hundred hour weeks or whatever, like then you need to do that. If, that. if that's what you need to do. So this is another example where that's somebody who is completely different to me, 
Mm. I can still be friendly with them. We have a completely yeah. different view on life. I'm not going to, mm. I'll put my point across. They can put their point across. And as long as we're not aggressive about it, we're still friends. Mm. Just don't stop talking about fucking lizard people living under the earth again. And then, <laughs> but it's, it's time. It's that concept of we're all just human. Our brains work differently. I have met people who can literally live off two, three hours sleep a night. Mm. I, I mean, they, they, to me, they're crazy. Mm. I've seen it happen. Mm. Um, fair play to them. They get a lot done. Mm. It's just not for me. Well, I, I like the example of an office, you know, with an office. I think temperature is a really good example because it's never right for everybody. In fact, mm. it's never right for more, more than one person. If it's ever right for one person, mm. because there's always someone that's like, I'm too hot. I'm too cold. I have to sit under this heater. It's always too warm in here. The person that wants to open the window and the person that's like, I'm freezing now. You feel window. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> any office anywhere you will have that dynamic going on. Oh, could you even have it when you're, you're the only person in the office as well? I'm always too cold. I'm going to have an egg with myself. Shall I look the heating on? I'm like, no, but that costs money. <laughs> but like, I'm cold. So like, yeah, but that money just goes to a multinational corporation. And so you have an argument with yourself, don't you, when you're on your own? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's the thing we're never happy. As humans, we're never happy to be happy. No, well, we're never happy to be content. If we're content, we're like, what's the catch? You need what? to be in a constant state of distraction. I think, <laughs> you, do you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, people talk about flow state, but that that's what you need. I think that's, you know, all the social engineering and media sort of stuff. It is, you know, when people talk about a distraction, but that's why we like it. Cause it's like, oh, look at things. I don't have to think about how to sit or what to do or where to go, or I'm, mm. I'm engaged for a second. <laughs> Um, I, so that's, that's me in terms of questions. I, I might've missed some out or whatever, but I want to give you a quick chance to sort of, if there's anything that you want to flag up before I stop the recording, anything that I haven't asked about that you want to talk about. I'm not going to lie. I've completely forgotten what we've talked about for most of this. Um, that's the problem with my brain. It's like, I've just been talking and talking and you'll get an, you'll get an opinion <laughs> from me. Which is my opinion. Like it's in, it's in my brain as an opinion and I'll say yeah. it. And then 20 minutes later, I'm like, what did we talk about again? What did I have an opinion on? I can't even remember. I know we talked about universal basic income. Mm. I feel like we had a rant about Brexit at one point, but I can't even yeah. remember what I ranted about anymore. I have to watch myself back to go, well, that's <laughs> what I said. So to be honest, you're saying, have I got any comments for you? And I'm like, well, I think so. We do. What did, what did we talk about? <laughs> What was the first question other than what did I want to be when I was younger? I'm like, I don't even remember what, like the order I said that in anymore. Now I'm like, oh, rugby, like player. rugby league player and then yeah. it was radiographer. Oh, and then lawyer. That was it. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, so it's just that part of thing where we've talked about something else. So that's gone from my mind. But, yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of just a quick question, in terms of the day to day running of the shop, mm. Does the ADHD have any effect on, on that? Oh, all the time. Um, yeah. so for example, Monday, I had a really busy weekend. So a lot of my stuff needed refilling. And even on the Sunday evening, I'm going, I can just do this Monday. There's a lot to do. Mm. And like at that point, I'm like, okay, I'll just put it off till Monday. And when I got in on Monday and it's that whole brain of when there's too many jobs to do. Mm. The brain shuts down. I mean, I looked at it all on even on Monday. I went, it's too much to do here. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, and then it just kind of sits there I and mean, somebody will come in and go, have you got any pasta? I'm like, is it in the container? And like, no, that's why I've asked you. And I'm like, well, yeah, I was meant to refill that. And then that's how I refill it is when they ask for a specific thing, I then go, right, I'll fill that one up. Yeah. And eventually it gets to a point where my brain is going, oh, okay. Doesn't look that bad now. Let me just do it all. Yeah. And then I'll do it all. And then, and then maybe I'll get distracted with another job. I and mean, then I'm just left with half a container, half filled. And it's like the, the ADHD brain has kicked off onto a different job now. But then yeah. when five jobs build up on top of each other, my brain then just goes, eh, I'm done for the day now. See you later. Mm. And then it does that whole kind of walking out and slamming a door like you're getting cartoons. <laughs> and I'm just going to set up the counter looking at a phone going, 
And I just go onto Facebook and Instagram then. I mean, my brain's not going to engage anymore. And it is, it, it's the real thing I can joke about. It. At least I can joke I'm, about it. I'm laughing because a lot yeah. of it sounds very familiar. Yeah. It's, a lot of people, it's a serious problem. I, I'm high functioning with it and I can still do the jobs. I can write a list and knock off jobs one by one. Mm. And I can at least joke about it. Whereas I've known some people where it's just that they will, when their brain shuts down, they, they can't just sit there and like mind numbingly read Facebook, Instagram, do something else just to take the mind off the list. That's it. They're done. They have to go to bed. They have to put the covers over their head just to de-stimulate. Yeah. And I've yeah. known people like that. And it's like, I'm, I'm just thankful that although I have this issue, it's, it could be a lot worse. Yeah. Like yeah. If I was like that, that's it. I would not have a shop. I, yeah. I couldn't do the shop because there's just too many jobs. So I can at least break it down over a week. And I think, yeah, so it definitely affects the running of the shop. Mm. Um, and there are jobs that, I mean, even now, um, I have customers saying, are you going to get olive oil in? And I'm like, I'll, I'll get it in next week. I'll, I'll put it on my list to do. And then my brain goes, but Ian, your list is so big. The list just ends up in the bin. And then next week they go, have you got it in yet? I'm like, oh, I knew it was on my list of things to do. Mm. And I'm, I'm not going to tell them that I threw the list in the bin because my brain just overloaded from ADHD. Just, mm. it, it just went, right, this list, gone. Otherwise I'll get nothing done. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I'd probably lose customers over it because I don't want to make excuses. It's just, mm. I just, the list got too big. Unfortunately, then I scrapped the list and start again. Thank you again to Ian for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests and thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subjects. And of course, most thanks to you, my dear listener. Come back next week for the, epi for the episode. Come back next week for the episode. Come back. It's an episode. Come back for it. Come back next week for the next episode. If you are Leeds, then come on this podcast. You don't have to agree with me or with previous guests or have anything in common with them or even know them. You just have to have some knowledge about work and be working in Leeds or be from Leeds or living here and working somewhere else. Okay, there's a lot of rules, but you get it, I, I reckon, I think. 
like, share, follow, and subscribe to this podcast. Don't let it die now. It's just getting interesting. Well, that's not true. It started off interesting, I think. I'm doing all I can to bring this to you. So if you do like anything about it, please follow the show on social. Give me money. Give money to the show. Tell people who you think are interesting to come on the show, no matter what they do for work. That's it. Static outro to follow. Back to series three next week. I haven't decided what it will be yet. If you follow me on social, you will find out there. There's some good ones coming up. And right now I do have a bunch of records lined up. I want to get to 50. That's a minimum before the show runs out of steam. And I have to get a proper, probably rubbish job to rot in before the deluge takes me. Okay, so that's enough sunshine and optimism from me for now. Cheers, ears. If you're listening to this, I assume you have some connection to Leeds, like living here or being from here. If you're such a person in Leeds or from Leeds and you haven't done your recording for working hours yet, then don't wait. Email me right now. Quick, get a pen. Workinghourspod at western-studios.com. Let's arrange some time for us to record your working hours interview. If you fancy being my guest, put guest in the subject and add a short bio and some suggestions of your availability into your message. If you want to be on working hours, we will need a two-hour window in which to record. I can record in your work time or during your downtime. I have been recording interviews over Zoom for over a year, but I can record offline too. You can appear on working hours anonymously, or you can promote yourself and your company or brand. Cleaner or owner, what is your experience? How do you feel about work? What do you like and not like? What do you do, Leeds? Be a part of local history. Have your voice heard. Share your wisdom. Give us the inside skinny. This is your show, Leeds. It's all about what you make of yourself. Do you know what you're doing? If you do, then come and tell me about it. Come on, even if you don't. Email me right now. Quick, get a pen. Workinghourspod at western-studios.com. If you're allowed to, that is. If you're not allowed to, then tell me why not. If you and your business aren't ashamed of what you do, then let's hear about it. What good are you doing the rest of us? Are you socially useful? Am I? Is this? Email me right now. Quick, get that pen. Workinghourspod at western-studios.com. Send me your feedback, questions, comments, and queries about working hours. What is happening, Leeds? Follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leads to find out when episodes are being released. Or use the hashtag, hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads on either Instagram or Twitter to find me. I'm on Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash Simon hyphen Treen. You can go to my company page, which is linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash Western hyphen studios. If you want to make a podcast in Leeds, whether it's for a cause, a publicity campaign, a product promotion, or your own passion projects, then get in touch with Western studios for support, advice, and guidance on anything podcasts. At Western Studios, you can work with a real lawyer who is actually in Leeds that you can actually work with on making podcast content. So don't wade through articles and videos and podcasts about how to make podcasts. Western Studios can make your podcast with you or even for you. Western Studios can take your podcast's admin, recording, editing, transcription, whatever. Tell me about it. I really want to hear from other failed screenwriters such as myself to look at making your material as audio content. So if you have an old script hanging around and again, you are leads based, then get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Got an inkling that you'd like a podcast but don't know where to start? Hit me up at makemypodcast at western-studios.com and we'll start making your podcast. First hour of consultation and pre-production is free, so what do you have to lose? Save the hassle, save the headache, and make your podcast with a Leeds-based, in real life podcast producer, me, at Western Studios Leeds. Once again, please let Working Hours get big and strong by joining its Patreon. Support Working Hours by becoming a champion on Patreon for a pound a month. You can also chat to me about the show, and God, do I need to find someone to talk to about this. Go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod right now and sign up, please. Please remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to this show. Every little bit helps. Tell your grand, tell your housekeeper, tell your gardener, tell your parole officer, tell your boss, tell Leeds. And I'll see thee then.
Working Hours is presented, edited, and recorded by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. The podcast is still at risk, so any donations of times share any donations of time shares. The podcast is still at risk, so any donations of time, shares, money, mentions, etc., are both desperately needed and gratefully received. Sorry, I just got stuck on time shares then. Timeshares also welcomed.